Cocooned in my strawberry shortcake comforter, six-year-old me stared at the wall next to my bed, analyzing two little holes that I'd never noticed before. Had they been there forever? Or were they new? How did they get there? The holes were perfectly round, the circumference of a toothpick maybe, and spaced about an inch apart. I ran my tongue across my upper row of teeth, estimating the distance between the two pointy ones on top. My body suddenly grew rigid with fear as I realized exactly what those tiny holes were, fang marks. <laughs> Clearly a vampire had flown in through my bedroom window in bad form while I was sleeping, but due to some sort of a navigational mishap, narrowly missed my neck and jammed into the wall. <laughs> he must have quickly collected himself and flown back out before I woke up. The prospect of the vampire's eventual return to finish the job was among a long list of things that frightened me so much every night that I'd wrap myself tight in my covers to the point I was sweating and begin a lengthy regimen of silent prayers. Dear guardian angels, please activate an invisible shield around me that will keep me safe from vampires, snakes, spiders, witches, and the devil. Please, please keep me alive until the sun comes up. And if I do somehow die, make sure I don't go to hell. I promise I'll be good forever. Thank you and amen. <laughs> but relying only on guardian angels would be foolish. I wasn't sure how skilled they were in defense. What if they were just those chubby baby angels from the famous painting? <laughs> so for backup, I also prayed to my grandma Kay, who died before I was born, because surely she could pull some strings up there. Then I made separate pleas to God and Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And only then would I allow my arms or legs to emerge from under my blankets, which acted as a temporary coat of armor until my holy energy dome was fully engaged. <laughs> my nightly childhood ritual was extreme, likely veering into obsessive compulsive territory. But the fears were valid to me, a first grader who had only recently outgrown her imaginary friend. At that time in my life, monsters and magic were very much alive and all around me. My dad's at least partially to blame for blurring the lines between real and pretend. As my throng of cousins could attest, he took joy in telling animated stories that struck fear in children, <laughs> and ironically also resulted in us begging for more of his stories. His tales weren't about horrifying creatures in faraway places. They were about horrifying creatures in our own backyard, and his stories were always peppered with just enough real-world evidence to seem perfectly feasible. He'd take my younger brother and me on walks around our suburban Chicago neighborhood and point out the magical landmarks an untrained eye would never see. Like the monstrous gargoyle perched on top of the, Victor the Victorian house a few blocks over. Only we knew that every night the beast would come to life, spreading its dragon-like wings and swooping around the neighborhood. The gargoyle was a protector, so its intentions were noble. But if we were outside too late at night, there's no guarantee it wouldn't mistake us for bad guys and snatch us up. <laughs> then there was the water pumping station across the street from our house. To commoners, it looked like open grassy hills with curved pipes popping up in a few spots. It held an underground reservoir of treated lake water. But we knew that within those waters, lived the same exact Kraken monster from the film Clash of the Titans, <laughs> with razor-sharp teeth and tentacles that could take down ships. I'd bring my ear to the opening of the pipes to hear the Kraken breathing. Yup, he's definitely down there, I confirm with my brother after listening to the monster's vibrating murmur. And there was the overgrown, hollowed-out bush on the corner of our neighbor's property. That was where the big bad wolf lived. Apparently, he was a very busy wolf because he'd always be out running errands when we stopped by. <laughs> I knew he was brutal when it came to pigs, but he didn't have any record of mauling children. So when I was feeling bold, I'd sneak into his den to see for myself what it was like to live as a, as a wolf. And that's why I say my dad is only somewhat to blame for the invented fears that led to my excessive bedtime ritual. His stories were scary, but fun scary, not nightmare scary. Okay, sometimes they were nightmare scary, but he didn't come up with the idea of the vampire visit. That was all me, maybe inspired by my fear of blood 
or that creepy Count Chocula guy interrupting my Saturday morning cartoon sessions? <laughs> By far, the greater influence than my dad was the horror of Sunday Mass at St. Vincent Ferrer Roman Catholic Church, where there was no escaping the larger-than-life bronze statue of crucified Jesus hanging beyond the altar, nails hammered through his hands and feet, thorns piercing his forehead. If the imagery wasn't upsetting enough, there was the cannibalism. Every Mass culminated with the ritual of Holy Communion where churchgoers lined up to gulp down the blood of Jesus from a shared goblet and devour little pieces of his body. Sure, it was really red wine and wafers of bread, or it started out that way. As I'd been learning in my weekly religion class, the wine and bread magically transform into Jesus' actual blood and actual body during Mass. There's even a scientific-sounding name for the process, transubstantiation making it all the more real. I was preparing to receive my first Holy Communion in less than a year, a white gowned event that would mark the start of my weekly participation in the gruesome feast. <laughs> Fortunately, my religion teacher assured me I would not have to drink the blood of Christ if I didn't want to, just to eat the body. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> But I really believed in this stuff with the same fervor that I believed in Santa Claus. I went on trusting the priest's stories about an evil serpent who could speak and about a massive global flood ordered by God himself that would have killed off all the animals if not for one very industrious ark builder. <laughs> <laughs> Believing in vampires really isn't so different. The fang marks remained on my bedroom wall, but my bedtime fears faded in the years that followed or I should say they changed, not due to any singular event, just the normal maturing process that happens to all kids around the age of eight or nine when reality becomes more real. Reality wasn't any less scary, though. The depleting ozone layer, the looming Gulf War, my parents' extremely uncivilized divorce. Those were the new monsters filling my head at night, and I couldn't even rely on my usual holy protectors to make me feel better is they took a major credibility hit when I began questioning the church. Why can't a woman ever be the Pope? I asked my grandma Anne at a family party. She should know. She went to Mass every single day and had rosary beads on her person at all times. Because women get their period, honey. <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen if a Pope ever got a period? <laughs> hmm. He does wear a lot of white. That could get messy. <laughs> but I knew this couldn't be the official reason. <laughs> then I learned the official reason, that Jesus chose only men to be his 12 apostles, so now and until the end of time, only men can be ordained in the Catholic Church. Jesus, really? <laughs> that made even less sense than the period excuse. Despite my increasing delusion with the church, skipping Sunday Mass was not an option. But I scaled way back on the prayers, trading them for nightly journal entries. As a preteen, my final connection with magic came in the form of a brief but passionate fixation with the magician David Copperfield. <laughs> Those spellcasting eyes. At the peak of my obsession, I saw her perform live downtown, where he levitated right on stage and teleported a bird across the theater. I cherished that playbill in my scrapbook and made it known to all that my dream job was to be David Copperfield's onstage lady helper, <laughs> the one he sought in half. I was old enough to know it wasn't real magic, just an illusion. Or was it? Maybe he did have some kind of supernatural ability and was using it to pretend he was the greatest magician of all time. But that phase vanished too, like the Statue of Liberty during David Copperfield's 1983 TV special. <laughs> and all that was left was a moody teenage existence, 100% devoid of enchantment. My dad moved to the faraway suburbs and we saw each other less as high school happenings dominated my world. My mom stayed put, but remarried a man prone to violent temper tantrums. And then she had a baby with him. 
another brother for me. My childhood home had become literal screaming chaos. I left for college and never moved back. But as my baby brother became a little kid, I'd feel a pull of nostalgia when I'd visit him there. Seeing the world through the eyes of a five-year-old, I missed the magical things from my childhood that I now remembered so vividly, even though they'd only ever existed in my imagination. And my heart ached for him having to deal with so much turmoil at home. So in the spurts of time that I had with him during my breaks from college or after I graduated, I introduced him to the, to the local magic scene. We checked out Big Bad Wolf's longtime residence. Still intact, but overly landscaped, without the same edge it had in the 80s. The gargoyle had also aged poorly, the details of its limestone face eroding in the years I wasn't looking. I needed fresher material. So I invented a new character of my own, Lenny the Leprechaun, an elusive little guy who lived in the yard. My brother and I would spend hours talking about what our three wishes would be if we ever caught him. He wished for things like being able to fly or becoming the youngest ever major league baseball player. Whereas my 20-year-old self would ask Lenny for the ability to speak flawless French or become a morning person. <laughs> Years later, when I had kids of my own, I wanted to embrace magic with them too, but not to help them escape a stressful home and not to scare them, mostly to have fun, be creative, soak up those early years when anything seems possible. But if I were to do it right, I'd have to be more than just a magic facilitator. I'd have to be a magic regulator. What magic was okay and what was disturbing. Religion was a no. <laughs> By the time my kids were toddlers, I decided the cost of this family tradition was too high. Yes, it would be nice for them to know what prayer comes next at a Catholic wedding, and when to kneel, then stand, then kneel, then stand. <laughs> but I didn't want them staring at a crucified young man every week and believing there's a hell, and I definitely wasn't okay letting them think I was okay with misogyny. Santa Claus seems like a totally harmless, magical figure at first glance. <laughs> One day before winter break, my preschooler asked me, does he really see you when you're sleeping and know when you're awake? <laughs> the question transported me to his age, and I felt the anxiety that comes with thinking you're being surveilled for good behavior by a higher power. And that's when I started referring to the man in red as the legend of Santa. <laughs> Now, leprechauns, they were allowed to stay. <laughs> Turns out that Lenny was just the start of my love affair with these tiny bearded men. <laughs> leprechauns embody a perfect mix of magic and mischief with a near zero fear factor. And for me, they're also a sort of tribute to my very Irish dad who died eight years ago before he could fully bestow his gift of fantastical storytelling on my children. Of course, I realized that if my dad were still alive, my kids would envision leprechauns that more closely resemble the murderous creatures of horror movies. <laughs> but I know he'd be impressed that my kids are now teenagers and may or may not still believe that leprechauns are the national treasure of Ireland, yet can sometimes be found as far from the motherland as Pacific Beach. <laughs> but I know that my kids are outgrowing magic too, which is why last summer, I jumped at the chance to step back into the world of make-believe, in the place it all started. My mom still lives in my childhood home, so I stopped by while I was in town for a wedding to spend some time with my little nieces and nephews. We were sitting in the backyard when my brother's four-year-old daughter put on her gym shoes and a plastic tiara and told me we were going on an adventure. Okay, let's do it. Where are we going? I asked. Princess Island, right over there, she said, pointing to the pumping station's open fields across the street. Have you been to Princess Island before? She asked me. No, I haven't, I told her. You'll have to show me everything. As we crossed the street and walked up the grassy hill, I didn't have the heart to tell her that not even six feet below the surface of Princess Island, <laughs> lurking in the hidden waters, lives the most vicious, dreaded sea monster ever known to mankind.
Give it up for Kelly Quigley.